Welcome everyone to the REBT Advocates. I believe this is episode 91. We're getting close to 100. And I'm Dr. Michael Edelstein. I'm a clinical psychologist in uh, San Francisco with a phone, Zoom, and Skype practice. And I'm a practitioner of REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. And I'm joined once again by another therapist, REBT therapist, Ross Grossman. And Ross, uh, did you want to say anything else, an introduction about yourself? Sure. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist, psychotherapist in Los Angeles, also hypnotherapist, uh, certified hypnotherapist and life coach. And I've been practicing in Los Angeles for some time. I've been practicing for over 25 years, 30 years, somewhere in that area. And I have been in Los Angeles since the early 2000s. Okay, very good. Also, uh, I want to mention uh, I'm author with my co-author, David Ramsey Steele, of the popular self-help book, Three Minute Therapy. Okay, uh, today Ross is going to be presenting a client who has fears uh, related to the current situation with the coronavirus. So uh, Ross, uh, do you want to tell us basically what the background is of uh, your client in the situation you'll be discussing? Right. Well, without describing the client too specifically, um, the client uh, could not shake the fear of basically the loss of life and, um, and could not think about much else other than the COVID virus. And my, uh, my thoughts were, there were two directions we could go in. One would be the practical, pragmatic idea of how possible is it that you will catch it and how possible is it that you will die going with the odds, which I'm not sure if that's the best tactic. And the other one would be to go with the more deeper philosophical aspect of REBT, which is to go with the worst case scenario and think about why that would not be horrible, awful, terrible, only sad, frustrating, disappointing if this person were to in fact contract it and or pass away. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks for the su succinct introduction. And I briefly want to have a third direction to go in. And uh, you introduced it in part, Russ, by saying the client could not shake the fear. Uh, now, actually, the truth is the client, is it he or she? Uh, she. The, the, the client has not shaken the fear yet, but that doesn't mean the client is not capable and can't shake the fear. So mm -hmm. this is, uh, and I'm glad uh, this came up because this is an important distinction I make with my clients that failure in the past doesn't equal failure in the future. So the fact that you haven't succeeded yet doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily uh, prove or cause you to fail in the future. And the idea that I can't tends to lead to giving up and pessimism. So that's a good thing to uh, keep in mind. And uh, this brings up the idea of semantic accuracy, which is to clean up your language, whether you're the client or especially the therapist as a role model. And mm -hmm. when you, uh, the therapist, or you, the client, hear yourself saying something that tends to lead to emotional disturbance, such as, I can't succeed, or I can't stand it, or I have to avoid the virus, those kinds of things, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then you would say uh, out loud or to yourself, what I meant was, I haven't succeeded yet. Or I mean, I prefer to avoid the virus rather than I must. So the more we uh, correct our language, the more likely we are to correct the meanings behind the language, although the meanings behind the language is really what counts but there is evidence that uh, thoughts shape language and language sa shapes thoughts. So uh, that would be my first comment. Does that make sense for us? It makes a lot of sense, yes. Okay, and then the second thing is when someone brings up a problem like she has, which seems to have 
uh, two kinds of issues. One is practical problems, what to do about the problem practically, and emotional problems, uh, anxiety, fear, panic, those kinds of things. Then I teach a problem separation technique, which briefly says uh, we have uh, practical problems going through life because we have goals and uh, we prefer to achieve those goals, which means we have a problem, how to achieve those goals. And then as therapists, we can teach clients various uh, practical problem solving strategies to achieve those goals, such as experimentation, trial and error, research, what's worked in the past, uh, networking, see how other people deal with it. So that's the practical side. And then the emotional side comes from being imperfect humans. We tend to escalate certain practical problems into emotional problems. And in this case, it's panic, uh, fear, anxiety about the virus or about the future. Uh, so normally what I recommend uh, is explaining the problem separation technique when these types of problems come up and then asking the client, well, we agree on the practical problem, how to avoid it in the future. Uh, do you have an emotional problem about it? And in this case, she would probably say, yes, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm fearful. Then I would ask, uh, so which would you, we could help you with both, which would you like to start with first? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have no questions about that, Ross, I'll ask you, which would you like to start with first? And I'll be the patient at this time, is that right? Uh, you can be the patient or the therapist. Would you like me to address you as the therapist in terms of which, how to help her? Uh, first um, I, I think it might be or did you want to role play the, to have me role play the patient. Okay, wonderful. Okay. And we'll call her Zelda. How's that? That sounds good. Hey, Zelda, would you like to, uh, you agree that you have a practical problem there and an emotional overlay. Is that correct? I'm not sure if I do agree. I think that anybody in my situation would be frightened. This is real life and death. I see. Oh, okay. That's a very good point. I'm glad you mentioned that. And the fact that it's an emotional problem doesn't mean it's easy or possible to get over it. It turns out it is possible to get over it. But, uh, but the fact that everyone else has the same emotional problem doesn't mean it's not an emotional problem. Uh, what an emotional problem consists of are emotions, not any emotion, just emotions that tend to disturb you, are maladaptive, dysfunctional, eat you up inside, lead you to obsess, ruminate, dwell, uh, lose sleep, overeat, or lose your appetite, those things. So do you have any of those uh, side effects of your anxiety? I do, but I want to say again, I think humans are built to be anxious in anxiety-producing situations. And I think it's realistic to be anxious about a life-threatening illness that is claiming so many lives. Oh, okay. So uh, tell me if I understand what you're saying, Zelda, and that is um, you feel that being anxious uh, is realistic. Everyone is anxious or would be anxious. So to conclude, I'll infer this is not something you'd like help with. Is that correct? Well, no, I, I want to be less anxious, but I, I, I guess what I'm really saying is I want this not to be happening because the only way my anxiety is going to stop is if there's no possibility that I could catch this virus. Oh, I see. Okay, so you'd like to uh, minimize or overcome your anxiety, but you don't think therapy could help you think that the, the only thing that could help is a change in, situ, in the situation. Is that correct? Uh, I, I'm guessing that because um, I, can't, I can't get rid of this and I, I've, I just don't know if your technique will help me. Yeah. Well, you said you can't get rid of this, but you haven't learned yet an approach to try to get rid of it. So let's say you haven't gotten rid of it yet. And then once you learn this approach, which we call rational emotive behavior therapy, and you give it a fair trial, then maybe, just maybe, we can conclude you can't get over it. So um, 
now you said you wanted to give this a fair trial. So I could give you suggestions on how to give this a fair trial if you like. Okay. Would you like okay. suggestions? All right. Okay, very good. So the first suggestion is to understand where anxiety and panic come from. And uh, although intuitively, in this case, it seems like it comes from the uh, threatening virus and the devastation it may cause, actually, that's not how we work. It's never situations that cause our emotions, but rather it's our thinking about situations. So it's never a activating event or adversity, the virus that causes C, but rather our anxiety, but rather it's our it, rather it's B, our belief. Humans are cognizing animals. We think about our experiences and then reach conclusions, often evaluative conclusions about our experience. And that what leads to emotions. So our emotions come from our thinking, not from situations directly. Does that make sense? It, it, it does, but there's a nagging feeling in me that when you face life and death, that Yeah, why? Uh, Ross, I, I mean, Zelda, <laughs> you just <laughs> cut out the last, I, I didn't get the last sentence at all. So do you want to try the last sentence again? Yeah, I, I, I want to believe you, but I also think that our anxiety and nervousness in these situations is built into us. It's baked in so that we can stay alive, that it's part of our evolution so that we can stay alive. That's why I'm feeling this way. That's what I'm worried about. That oh, I see. Okay, so that's a good point, that perhaps feeling anxious is uh, genetically determined in our brains, um, and that's why we feel anxious. And you have a good point there, and that is uh, when we have emotions, thought, or thoughts, uh, there are um, correlates, neuropsychological correlates in our brain that have a genetic influence but it's but an influence is not a determined doesn't mean it's determined. So we can work on our influences. So for example, if you're not talented and you it's hard for you to sing well, if you took a lot of music lessons and practiced, you could sing better. Maybe not like an opera singer, but you could mm. learn to sing better. Uh, although you've uh, spent or your life, I'm assuming, learning and practicing English, if you started practicing French, you would not speak French fluently like a native, but if you practice conscientiously, you could speak well enough to be understood by a native. So uh, these predispositions, uh, which you rightly point out, are just predispositions, are just influences but the main determinant of our emotions is our thinking in the present. The current cause is our thinking in the present. And we have various influences, and you uh, pointed out one of them. So does that make sense, Zelda, the difference between an influence and a direct cause of uh, our emotions? If I can restate what I think you're saying. Yeah. You're saying that even though most people who were confronted by a life-threatening plague pandemic might have a built-in tendency to uh, panic or become anxious, that we could still change that. We could still alter that. Maybe not 100%, not perfectly, but somewhat. Yeah, I'm saying two things. That's one of them. That's an important one. Okay. We can change it to some extent through practice reinforcement uh, of the a helpful way. There are things you can practice and reinforce that wouldn't be helpful. And uh, the other thing you're saying is um, that uh, our emotions do come from our thinking, and the way to change our emotions is by changing our thinking. I think you implied that. Is that correct? Um, yes. Right. Okay, very good. Very good. So I think we're on the same page. So the next step is uh, to move ahead and see how you can identify the thinking that's causing your anxiety and uh, then how you can change that thinking. 
Uh, so could you give me a recent situation where you felt particularly anxious about uh, the, this disease that's going around? Was it this morning, yesterday? I, I, I brought home some food. I forgot to, uh, I wasn't sure if I washed it correctly. I wasn't sure if I washed the packaging correctly. Um, I have a housemate. I am not sure if they sipped out of my cup. And I don't know if they have been exposed. And so I'm concerned that I either have already been exposed or that I'm in danger, constant danger of being exposed. Okay, you mentioned a number of things here, but let's uh, focus on one of them for the sake of clarity and simplicity. So one of the things you said was you're not sure uh, if you wash the package properly. Is that correct? Right. So I think I, I might have already infected myself. Right. So you're not sure if you wash the package properly and you're not sure if you infected yourself. Okay. So that's the situation. And then you felt anxious about that. Is that correct? Yes. Very anxious. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is to think in terms of the first three letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. A mm. is the activating event or the adversity or possible adversity. So your A is that you're not sure if you've infected yourself. That's, that's right. Then at C, you felt anxious, your consequent emotion. Uh, y yes, very. Okay, good. But we've agreed that A doesn't cause C. The situation or the potential situation of having infected yourself at A uh, caused your anxiety, but rather it was your thinking about it, and that's B, your belief. Are you with uh, me? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Now, uh, so we're looking for your belief or your think thinking. Now, in order to have a disturbed emotion, and one way to define a disturbed emotion, it's an emotion you'd rather not have, which uh, is what you said would be anxiety. Um, you, in order to have that type of emotion, it means thinking in terms of demands. Must, should, supposed tos, have tos, escalating your preferences, especially strong preferences, like not getting infected mm -hmm. into demands, which you may rightly point out again, is a human tendency to escalate our strong preferences into demands. So it's natural you would do it, but it's those demands that absolutistic kind of thinking, these fictions, uh, in terms of must, should, supposed tos, have tos, that lead to anxiety and worry. So in looking for your thinking, uh, what did you tell yourself right after you thought I might have infected myself that began with I must or I should or I must not or I should not something? Before I infected myself? I, I've been thinking... No, 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 not before you infected yourself. When you thought you might have oh. infected yourself and then got anxious, what did I, you tell yes, yourself? I, I, oh, just I, I let me finish this thought, Rush. Oh, I just okay. want to finish this thought. Uh, what did you tell yourself right after you thought you might have infected yourself, right before you started to get anxious, that began with I must or I should okay. or I must I, not or I, should I must, not something? I must not have this virus. I must not get infected. Okay, very good. I must not get infected. You identified that quite well. Uh, so that illustrates uh, the theory, which is that the possibility of getting infected at A was caused uh, not your anxiety, but rather it was B. I must not get affected by the virus caused the, your anxiety, C. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so B causes C. Our belief causes our situations, not A. Okay, so, so the next step is to look for the evidence for your irrational belief. You can think of the irrational belief as a hypothesis. This is your theory that you must not be affected, mm -hmm. uh, infected or affected. Uh, that's your theory, you must not. So we're gonna be little scientists and look for the evidence for that. Now, we would agree, I think, that there's plenty of evidence 
for your preference. That there's good reason why you strongly prefer not to be infected because uh, you don't want to be sick. If you're sick, you have all kinds of disadvantages. You might even die, which uh, might be the most, uh, the worst disadvantage. So there are many reasons why it would be preferable not to be infected. But we're not asking why would be preferable. We're asking why must you avoid what it would be preferable to what it would be preferable to avoid, which is not get infected. So what's the answer to that? What's the evidence for the mustness of your preference? Because I must live. I must live. That's the evidence. People are supposed to live. They're not supposed to die. Okay. Okay. Very good. Not, so not really, early anyway. What's that? Not die not early. early. Yeah. Not die early, is that what you said? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So um, now I agree, and I think we agree, it would be highly preferable, maybe at the 99.9% .9 level, that you not die early of the coronavirus. We agree on that. Yes. But so, and we could give evidence for that. What's the evidence? for the must, because it's the must, that's the toxic part here, the, that's the part that causes your anxiety. What's the evidence that you must not die early simply because you prefer not to die early? Because you run the universe and therefore you have to escape early uh, I death? I just believe that somehow there's some sort of fairness in the universe. I believe that there's some sort of I guess some sort of universal order. And I think I'm, maybe I'm supposed to be here longer. I'm supposed to, I'm meant to be here. And maybe there are things I need, I'm meant to do. I'm not ready yet to be, to be, have the end of my life. Well, if there's universal order, meaning that you're meant to be here longer, then you'll be here longer. Uh, unless you're powerful enough to, to act against universal order. Um, Isn't that right? Yes, but I... I'm okay, guessing. so then you're safe if there's oh, universal oh, oh, order. Wait, in this world, I guess there's ways you could do a misstep and, and, and have something bad happen despite that. Yeah, okay, but let's assume the worst case scenario. You can do a misstep like touching the virus on your package of food uh -huh. and, and die early. That would be sad and it would be preferable not to. No mm -hmm. one wants to die early, probably. But what's the evidence? Because you strongly prefer it, you must not. What's the evidence for that must? Well, um, I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain here. Right. Uh, there, what's the evidence that, there, that I must not die? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, I guess there isn't any. I just... That's want yeah. there to be. Right. Okay. Very good. So you want there to be evidence. You won't die. So you take the proper precautions. Uh, but I agree with you and you got the right answer. There's no evidence you must not die. Uh, there's just evidence you prefer not to. Uh, if there was a, as we were saying, if there was a cosmic law of the universe saying you must not die, you wouldn't die. Um, so does that make sense? It does, but it makes me feel that we're in a very awful world. Okay, well, that's, terrible, a terrible that's, world. that's a different issue, but let's stick with this anxiety caused by okay. this must. So um, now if you were writing all this out, then at D, disputing your irrational belief or questioning mm -hmm. it, you would write the question we came up with, what's the evidence I must not die early, even though I prefer not to. And then at E, effective new thinking, or the answer to the question, you would write uh, the first response that you came up with, which is, although I prefer not to die early, there's no reason I must not die early. Although it would be very, very sad and tragic if I did die early. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, and then normally the more you write at E or the more you remind yourself of why the must is false, that's meaningful, the more persuasive yeah. the, these rational beliefs or this effective philosophy is. So we could come up with some more E's such as it would be 
highly disadvantageous and sabotage my important goals if I die early, but it would hardly be awful, terrible, or horrible, or the end of the world. The world will go on even if I'm dead, and I don't. I wouldn't like the prospect of dying early, but I definitely can stand this prospect even though I don't like it. I've survived anxiety and worry about fears of death in the past, and I'll most likely survive it this time. And most importantly, it's not the prospect of dying early that makes me anxious, but rather it's my irrational must thinking about it that causes my anxiety. And with practice, I can change my thinking. Were any of those statements not meaningful or did they make sense? Well, they have meaning, but I'm still left with one nagging feeling, which is yeah. how can life be meaningful if it could be taken so randomly? How can my life have meaning? Uh, where, where is the meaning in me yeah. losing my life to this thing? Where, how is that meaningful? Okay, well, that's an... That's a question, and that's really more of a practical problem. Earlier we discussed practical problems uh, versus emotional problems, and your practical problem, if you want meaning in your life, is to figure out how to get it. Um, so if you're lost, you, say driving, the, your first thought is uh, not that I'm lost, I give up, but I'm lost, I have a goal, figure out how to get unlost. So if you have no meaning in your life, that gives you meaning or a goal, figure out how to define meaning into your life. So that's something we all do. We give our lives meaning. Some people decide the meaning in their life is to help others. Uh, some people decide that the meaning in their life is to write the great American novel. Some people decide that the meaning in their life is to have a deep, intimate relationship. So it's up to you to define meaning into your life. So that's a few words about the practical problem. Getting back, and we could discuss meaning a little more if you like, Zelda, okay. but getting back to uh, this three-minute exercise, I, uh, let's cap it off with F, your new feeling. And you said the ease made sense to you and seemed yes. useful. Uh, although you had it raised other questions, which is fine. So your F, your new feeling, would be great concern about the possibility of getting the virus or dying right. early. Um, being vigilant and learning as much as you can to take measures to avoid it. And uh, there are a lot of measures people are taking now. Mm -hmm. So that would be more appropriate emotions and behaviors rather than anxiety and panic and worrying. Any questions about the three-minute exercises? No, no. Uh, but would you go to G? Would you go to a new goal? Yes, that would be very good uh, if you want to have a G, a new goal, or give yourself a homework assignment. So what would your new G be? Well, if I haven't already been doing so, it would be to be taking, learning all the safety precautions and taking them. Um, and... Uh, I suppose um, trying to busy my mind with something else besides thinking about the virus all the time. Right. And I will suggest another goal along with your excellent ones. And that is write out these three minute exercises that we just went through on a regular basis, once a day, twice a day, 10 million times a day. By the way, if you write it out 10 million times a day, you'll be cured after two days. So um, that's a joke. But uh, get so, uh, so that's another thing you can do. And also you can question your must. I must not die early in your head at any time you want and ask yourself, what's the evidence that I must uh, have my preference, which is to live a long, healthy life. And the answer is always, there's no evidence for the must. You or I could get hit by a truck tomorrow, even though we strongly prefer not to. And that's the end of our lives. There are, is no certainty uh, in our lives. There's just high probabilities. And the way to make the probability higher that we live a long life 
is by v be vigilant and take proper precautions. Okay, any right. questions about any of that from the client or you as a therapist perspective? No, I, I think it's very validating and it's, it's kind of the direction I'm going in. I, I do tend to have very vociferously resisting clients who, who may not believe as strongly in the process and that may be our, our sticking point. And okay, that's very good. And if they express that, then I would suggest running an experiment. Okay, in fact, I don't want you to believe anything just because I say it, so I'm glad you're skeptical, Zelda. Uh, so let's run an experiment. Write out a couple of three-minute exercises the way we discussed every day for the next two weeks, and uh, we'll see if your thinking starts to change and if your emotions start to change, uh, then I imagine that will be somewhat persuasive for you. And if not, if that doesn't happen, then we can discuss it and see what went wrong. How does that sound as another G? Sounds, sounds good. Uh, you know, of course. Okay, usual, very good. I hate well, writing. But. Good. Very good. Well, you asked a lot of excellent questions uh, that went to the heart of this approach. So keep asking questions. And uh, Zelda, I'm afraid we're out of time right now. So let's discuss meaning next time. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Ross. Any final words as the therapist in terms of the supervision? No, it's just uh, very validating and uh, feels pretty much on the track that I've been on, except I do see how uh, using the experiment uh, um, sort of meta, you know, experiment language will help with people who are fighting the process. Okay, very good. Now, I don't know if I'm different as a therapist, but I rarely get clients these days that are so vociferously object to this approach, but I'm sure there are some out there. So I think it was very good that you role played a most difficult client because I think this illustrated some of the main uh, principles and also as a therapist being persistent and also seeing yourself that there are no musts and shoulds. So the client doesn't convince you <laughs> that she must not die early. Be uh, so it helps if you're uh, convinced of that and you see that musts and shoulds are fictions. And one of the ways to do that is to write out those three-minute exercises yourself. As I often mention, I write out two three-minute exercises for myself every day, and I think this keeps me sharp as a therapist. So that's a, uh, something I'd recommend to uh, therapists. I agree. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for participating, Ross, and uh, thank uh, you viewers for watching the REBT Advocates. Uh, we're looking for therapist volunteers uh, who are as courageous as Ross to do this or clients or non-clients who volunteers who have personal problems who would like to discuss it on the REBT Advocates. And uh, if you found this valuable, uh, uh, put your questions and comments below uh, and support us on Patreon, suggest subjects and uh, keep doing the three minute exercises to, and keep watching the RBT advocates to stay on the rational side of life.